Good. All right. So um, a number of you fell into the trap that I predicted you would fall into. <laughs> you looked at the prologue and you deduced from the prologue your theology. <laughs> what did I say about the prologue? Somebody remind me. <laughs> it was. It doesn't um, really reflect his beliefs, or the middle reflects way more than other. Okay. Yes. Next time, remember to raise your voice. Sorry. Hands <laughs> so you all don't talk at once. So yes, right. Uh, Crystal, you have something to add. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say how you mentioned that the prologue was a sort of. Uh, I forget. I don't know how to word it correctly, but the author was kind of like making fun of the original text, and that's what the prologue was. Making fun of the traditional views of God, right? Yeah. So, uh, and remember, the book of Job is not, maybe it's based on historical events, but it's written kind of like a fable, right? So don't take stuff literally. Some of you are taking this prologue literally. <laughs> Stop it, <laughs> right? This is the author weaving a tale, and possibly, of course, Job existed, possibly, and I'm sure he did. Everybody, I mean, this is standard standard human being, right? So remember, right, the author is weaving a tale, a philosophical tale that we are supposed to learn from. Don't take things literally, right? So, and especially in the prologue and the epilogue, remember this, make sure you jot this down. Here the author is making fun, he's being ironic, he's making fun of the traditional views of religion, traditional views of God, and so forth. He's trying to move away from those views, right? So if you're going around saying, oh, at least 80% of you were going around all spooked up by how God, you know, how could God allow this? And, and how could he allow himself to be moved by Satan? And God didn't do any of this. This is all, this is the prologue. This is pure fiction, <laughs> right? The real thing, the real message we know is going to come in the dialogues. Is everybody super clear on this? Put your hand in the screen. Who is not clear about what I just said? Who's confused? Raise your hand. Okay. Okay. So be careful, all of you. In the test, I don't want to see this. If I see this in the test, you're going to lose points. Now it's okay. You can write what you want in your reading assignments. But if I see you in the test, <laughs> drawing your, or, you know, drawing your theology from the prologue, you're going to miss points, <laughs> right? Because that will show me you have misunderstood the book completely. <laughs> Islam, you have a question? Yes, okay. just a quick one. Uh, this is for just the book of Job, right? Or is this for future books to have dialogue, prologue, and epilogue? No, no, just the book of Job, right? Future books will be different. <laughs> okay, excellent. So let's remind ourselves, let's go into this prologue now, right? Uh, Crystal, remember to take down your hand if you're done with your question. Um, Oh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I was just going to ask. Um, so only I just wanted to clarify. Uh, only the dialogue is like what's correct, right? Yes, the okay. dialogue is what you want to focus on to to deduce your theology. Who God is, right? All right. Who God is? We're going. What the Book of Job is doing? He's starting from a view of God, which is in the prologue, which most people have that God is playing with our destinies, that he's the source of our suffering, that he's allowing evil to take control. I mean, most of us have this view that God is somehow behind our pain <laughs> and we blame him, right? Why we blame him? Because we believe he's in control. He's the one behind our pain. So the prologue actually is what most of us think. In the book of Job, we're going to move from that perspective to a new vision of who God is, right? So we have to be ready for that right? Okay, so let's go to this prologue. We're going to learn a few things about Job, and again, again, this he's making fun, right? He, this is all ironic. So let's begin. Go to page five. Uh, are you all there? Wave at me if you're there. Page five. Put your hand in the screen. Okay. All right, we're going to have, first of all, a description of Job. Once upon a time, in the land of Uz, there was a man named Job. And now it's very interesting. Watch this. Watch what the author does. He was a man of perfect integrity who feared God and avoided evil. And at that moment, you're waiting to hear details about what? What did the author just say about Job? He has integrity, he fears God. What kind of list do you want to have now? What do you think the author should de describe at this point? Oh, he wasn't, um, well, his morals. Exactly, Colon. Good, Colon. Next time, raise your hand, but good. All right. <laughs> Yes, uh, uh, who was the other one? You are, it disappears. I, this Zoom is driving me crazy. Karuchi, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you, you would expect the, the author would describe uh, how he lived his faith. 
Okay, excellent, right? You would expect a list of virtues, you know, he helped the poor, he helped the widow, he was, you know, he did his, you know, sacrifices. Instead, what do you have? What is the list you have here? What, do you, what does the author list instead of the virtues? Uh, Eva Tulin, go ahead. He feared God and avoided evil, that's it? No, right after that, the list, after the description of his goodness. Karuchi, go ahead. He kind of gives us his demographics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, he had a uh, family and daughters and sheep and ox and, you know, that kind of thing. Like Absolutely. Material so, stuff. An inventory of his wealth, right? So this is, you should already see what the author is trying to do. What is the author trying to connect? And what is the subliminal message? Gianna Copulos. Um, that he was a good man, but he was very rich. So yeah, that, we know that, but <laughs> what's the author saying by connecting the two? What is the subtle message he's giving us? Uh, let's see, I have no idea who's raising their hands. Uh, Crystal, last name, please. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll fix that in a second. Um, he's indirectly saying that the reason that, you know, that he has all this stuff because he fears God and avoids evil. Exactly. The author is making a very subtle point. He's saying Job is virtuous connecting to his wealth the the hidden message is that perhaps job is virtuous because he knows that will make him wealthy right which is exactly what the accuser was saying right so the author is kind of subtly saying that job's virtue in a way is what gives rise to his wealth right he was perfect integrity avoided evil and therefore it seems right he had seven sons daughters sheep camels oxen right so the author is kind of making fun of job kind of making a very subtle criticism is job really virtuous for the sake of virtue or is he virtuous for the sake of all of the wealth that will ensue from this virtue right so make sure you write this down the author seems to be hinting that Job might be serving God in order to be wealthy. Job knows that if he serves God, he will be blessed, and perhaps this is the only reason he's doing so. Karuchi. <clears throat> yeah, I, I had a thought about that too. Uh, I was thinking that uh, perhaps he's also uh, making commentary on those who are quote unquote faithful, that perhaps these are the things that they hope that God gives them. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, and maybe that's what they pray for. Like, I pray for a new job, new money, you know, I hope I get that house. I want that girl, you know, or, or whatever, which is, uh, which is kind of all of the material things that are unsustainable in life anyway, but your faith is supposed to carry you through anything. Exactly, right? Behind Job, there is a criticism of the average believer, which most of us are at that stage, by the way. None of us really leave completely that state, right? We all want to, right? We're all at some point asking God, please give me this, you know, this grade or this car or this person, right? And so he's really criticizing a certain religious mentality that is thinking that God is a kind of, you know, universal vending machine that if you poke it in the right way, right, if you do some sacrifices and prayers in the right way, boom, you will get all right. If you go to in Barnes and Nobles to the aisle, very big aisle on Christianity, many, many of these books is how God can make you prosperous, how God can help you find your soulmate, how God can do this, how God can do that. Right. Our society has made religion into this kind of dynamic. Right. We are living in a time where God is just there to bless us right and so we we have here a subtle criticism right is god just this big vending machine that if you do the right thing he's going to give you what you need or is it more complicated than that right so that's the first now let's just uh, stop briefly on the description of job because a lot of you were annoyed that job had slaves <laughs> some of you were annoyed that he was so rich <laughs> right can you really be that good if you're that rich right and so i want to stop on the hebrew of this definition of perfect integrity and uh the other uh, actually the translation is, is not so good usually it's good translation but he's missing there's two words here that describe job i'm going to write them in the chat and this is important he is yasha in hebrew right and he is tam okay let's look at these two words yasha simply means straight literally so meaning job is what's the line right he is uh what did i put in my notes i put it in a certain way yeah he follows right he follows the norm 
yashar is you're going straight. You're following the rules. You're following the, the right path, right? It could almost be you walk the line, right? I think that's even a, a good translation of it. He walks the line. He does what he's told, right? There's no thinking through, just doing what he's told. And then, so this in a way could, you could understand better why he has slaves, right? Because if he walks the line and follows the rules of society of his time, then he's going to have slaves. So Job in this text is, is um, he, and, and we'll see this with the word tam, he's not yet at the highest level of spirituality. We're, we see this in the word tam. Tam means actually naive. Okay, that's what it means. It's a first, it, it, and more specifically actually, Tam in, in our today's vernacular would be Mr. Nice Guy, <laughs> right? Job is a nice guy. That's basically what the text is saying. Job is a nice guy. Now, does this make him particularly elevated to be a nice guy? Why do you think he's a nice guy? What makes him such a nice guy? <laughs> what's, what's missing in Mr. Nice Guy? Colon, go ahead. I was going to say he can attribute that to his morals. You go, what? Sorry? Attribute it to his morals. So, yeah. So he's moral, but moral in the sense of walking the line, doing what he's told, right? Nothing outside of the box. And at the same time, he's very naive. So the text is, is this, there's a slight criticism, right? I see one of you answered, Ahmad. Go ahead, Ahmad. Tell us more. This is interesting what you wrote in the chat. <laughs> Uh, just, um, he needs to get tested, Mr. Nice Guy. He's just like a little child, <laughs> um, doing what mommy and daddy says is right. And yeah. then life, yeah. yeah. You got it. Job is missing a taste of dirt. I mean, you put it very nicely, right? He's Mr. Nice Guy because he's been sheltered all his life. He, he, he was born in wealth with a silver spoon in his mouth. Of course he's going to be nice. Who's not going to be nice, right? He hasn't yet gone through the darkness, the dirt, right? And this is why his, his, his goodness or his righteousness is still considered by the text naive, simplistic, childish, right? He hasn't yet grown to the full spiritual level, right? When we study Maimonides next, right? Actually, this is our next author. He says, Job was good, but he wasn't yet wise, right? Why? Because he hadn't yet gone through life. You're not truly good. If you haven't been like, uh, who was it again? Ah. Uh, Ahmad said, right, if you haven't been tested, right? He hasn't gone through the dirt. Uh, Kor, you have a question. Go ahead. <clears throat> I wanted to say how um, Job has had it easy. Like he's had wealth and he's had his family there. He hasn't seen hardship. So once he gets that, he's like, oh, I give up. Like, okay. That's it. I'm, I'm done. And it's just, it just shows us how it's like in good times, if you're like doing okay, it's because God is helping you. And then if one thing goes bad, it's like, okay, I'm being punished now. Okay. And God hates me. Yeah. Very good. He's not able to see God in, right? Or he sees God everywhere, but in a way that's, you know, problematic. Like right? in a way he's, he's, he's unable to deal with the pain, at least initially, right? Very good course. So we will now see the process right? Whereby we will now see Job entering this dark night and see how he comes out, right? And what's interesting is that the way he comes out is completely different than the way he used to be. In other words, the whole process of suffering, right, that he goes through is going to make Job into a completely different person. And we have to see what happens. What is the transformation that occurs, right? Uh, and, and, and who does Job become, right? He's moving away. We'll see that he's not only moving away from his friends, right, in the story. His friends come, they have a certain theology, they have a certain worldview, and Job is like, no, you guys make no sense. This is not working for me, what you're saying, right? So he's moving away from his friends, but he's also moving away from himself, right? In the text, he's changing. So I wanna stop right now briefly, after I get a couple questions, right? I wanna stop right now briefly on how Job changes. Who was he in the prologue and who, does, who do you see him becoming in the dialogues, right? First of all, a couple questions, let's see. Well, the questions are gone. Um, okay, no more questions? <laughs> all right, oops, I missed it. Islam, go ahead. <laughs> um, so you're basically saying that the believer or 
Well, I'm not sure. I see him as a prophet of God the way I learned it. But when he's, you're saying the, he's not like, in the beginning, he's not tested. So he's not, he hasn't really learned uh, what's after or what goes after even, or even how a test feels like. And then when he goes through the test, the version I learned, I think when he goes through the tests and trials, and these are like, this is like losing like his family and everything. So after those trials, he is able to stay like faithful to the creator. Is that what you're saying? And he's more matured as a believer after trials from the creator. So we don't know yet, right? Oh, okay, we okay. know he changes, but we don't know where, what he did. Okay. We're about to get there, right? And we don't, yeah. I don't know yet if it will look exactly like the vision you had, right? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> get we'll there. See. Uh, good, we'll now see. there's a couple more people who have their hands up and I have no idea who you are. Uh, go back, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think that, you know, over time, you know, I'm, it might be too light to say that he becomes a questioner. I think that he becomes pretty agitated at a lot of the things that, you know, that in his mind, God is uh, is personally putting him through. And then I think, you know, I mean, I don't want to, I know we're not there yet, but obviously it gets to the point where God explains to him that it's not so black and white. And I think those three friends that he has are supposed to, are, are presenting a really black and white view of what, I guess, back then religion was or you know sometimes it could still be today um so i guess the growth of him kind of becoming a, a question or someone who as we'll see later wrestles with god and really questions what's going on and understands that you know it's okay to kind of question things but not necessarily but do it with the understanding that you know you don't necessarily know everything and it might not be through like the prism with which you're looking at Okay, good. You're bringing us to my to the question I asked, right? So this is the question: Whom does Job become as he begins to suffer? And the first thing we're seeing here, I'm going to put in the chat, is what Goldberg mentions. He moves from being submissive to rebellious, right? Let's look at that a little bit. Um, actually, yeah. Yes, let's do that, right? So first thing we notice, right, Job is moving from being pretty submissive, right? When you look at the prologue, you see him, you know, very neatly doing the right thing, right? When his, when his children go and do a party, he comes the next day, makes a big sacrifice just in case they sinned, right? You see Job very, you know, doing everything perfect, making sure every, um, uh, uh, how do we say, every letter is dotted. What is this, the, the expression with the dot and the line? Um, anybody knows? <laughs> I do, do you know? <laughs> he, he dots his I's and he crosses his T's. There we go, thank you, thank you, Karachi, right? He dots his I's, all his I's are dotted, all his T's are crossed neatly, right? Job is the person in handwriting class who would have that perfect handwriting, right, that everyone can read. So he's now changing, right? This is not the same Job when you have, uh, let me go to page uh, 23, for example, go there with me. Go to page 23, let's see, everybody's on page 23, put your hand in the screen, if you're there, okay. So I'm reading at the last uh, paragraph, right? Therefore I refuse, are you there? Put your hand in the screen, if you're there, therefore I refuse. Okay, so here's Job now, right? Therefore I refuse to be quiet. I will cry out my bitter despair, right? He's, he's in a way unleashed, right? The nice, stable Job who was, you know, doing everything perfect, walking the line, now he's all over the place. He's angry, he's frustrated, he's unleashing his, he's becoming rebellious. And like Goldberg said, he is doubting, questioning, angry, frustrated, right? That's the first shift we have. What other two shifts do we see in the text? Let's see who still has their hand up. Um, Adu, go ahead. So I, I have my hand raised, not particularly for this, but more to like, I guess, answer the first question. Um, so like from a psychological standpoint, he kind of goes through like the stages of grief um, where, well, I have to pull them up, hold on. Pretty much like he goes from, throughout the text, like he was, in denial about like what had happened to him then from that he goes on to anger at god for letting this happen to him then bargaining where he's like oh well you know if god just gave me the chance to speak to him i would tell him what my qualms were with him um depression because he was obviously upset with the loss of his children and his possessions and then finally acceptance but not acceptance of god but more so 
the concept of his anger towards God and his willingness to pretty much detest him, if that makes any sense. Yes, absolutely. Good. You bring me to the second point, actually, right? Unknowingly. Job moves from being robotic to becoming passionate. He's full of emotions, right? The, seven, the five stages of grief are five different emotions that you allow yourself to feel, right? First of all, denial, then anger, then sorrow. I forget which one, <laughs> which order it is, right? For me, it would be anger throughout. <laughs> so I'd be stuck in that phase, right? And eventually, so what we see here is a Job before the Job we see in the prologue. There is no emotional quality. He's just going through the motions. We don't know what he's feeling, what he's thinking. He's just kind of like a robot, right? All of a sudden in the text now, when he goes through the suffering, there is an explosion of emotions. You see everything. Adu makes an excellent point. You see anger, frustration, anxiety. You see sorrow, depression, lethargy, right? You see the whole spectrum of emotions. All of a sudden he becomes emotional right? So let me write this down. The second thing that changes, right? He goes from being robotic to emotional. And emotional in a very unguarded, uncontrollable way. He's not emotional like we are supposed to be emotional, you know, and always keep it together. He's not together. He's completely undone. He's all over the place, right? So that's the second shift, right? Let's see. There were a couple of questions as I was talking um man i can't believe i have to do this i'm gonna call zoom like tonight and go back to the old way so much better okay anyone knows the third shift that occurs for job so now we know he's rebellious he's emotional there's one more thing that is different from the job in the dialogues with regards to the job of the prologue anybody catch it <clears throat> okay no nobody knows <laughs> in the prologue do you think that job knows what he's doing does he have a sense of how to play the game in the prologue what would you say does he know the game the rules or think he knows okay islam very good right job of the prologue knows the game <laughs> right he knows if he does this then that right if he offers the sacrifices, then God will forgive his children. If he is virtuous, then God will bless him. He knows the rules. He is very clear in his mind what to do, what not to do in order to get X, Y, Z result, right? So in a way, Job is very clear, right? He's very, he, he has mental clarity about how to live, what to do, and so forth. What do you see now? in the dialogues that is different uh, i think there was one of you al Haddai, go ahead um so i just said that since since now he lost all his power he, he has no money no kids nothing to protect now he's just he's speaking his mind he's not <laughs> holding back anymore okay good i'm gonna put that in the first point right he has nothing to lose and now he's just gonna say what he's gotta say right so that's again the job that is unhinged job without control job without any more you know of society's restrictions he has nothing to lose so he's gonna say what what he thinks right so but going so good right that fits very nicely in the first one but for this third one how would you say job is different from the first prologue job who knows how to do things who understands the system he knows the rules of the game what's different now janakopoulos go ahead so like before he knew what he had to do and if he did something then he knew the outcome but now he's like god he questions god he's like god why do you why do you punish me if you know i'm righteous if you know i'm innocent he goes he said he thinks that he knows he's innocent right and so he goes if i'm innocent like good is only supposed to happen but but he's confused now because he was innocent quote unquote but now only bad things are happening to him so he really has no idea what's going on or what he should even do and so he starts to question god he's like do you have a human mind do you see with a human eye you know like are you really all knowing any questions and like and continues continuously he just really does not know what to do very good right he all of a sudden now he has no clue god is cheating it's like god is cheating at this at the gate right the rules are not functioning he's lost sense of what are the rules what how do we play this game that's why he's asking god what 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 do you want from me 
right? What do you want me to do? I've done everything. Why is this happening? He doesn't, the system is not working, right? There is a breakdown. <laughs> so he's moving, as I put in the chat, from clarity to confusion. So I'm going to say a little more about that in a second, but there's a couple more questions I want to go over. Uh, Islam, and then go ahead, Islam. Um, yeah, it just, uh, I, just like, I, I just, I can't speak. Oh my God. It reminds me of uh, how I learned when I was a kid, if God loves you, he tests you. So that kind of like, <laughs> but it reminds me also how it's really like in the middle of the book, the dialogue, if I'm not wrong, he starts to rebel. And this, this other shift that happens instead of being, you know, the perfect job and expecting the system to work the way it's supposed to work. But then God tests him. It reminds me of how uh, he becomes rebellious, like how Satan becomes rebellious to when the creator commands him to do something, but he doesn't. And God says, I know things that you don't know. But yeah, just my two cents. Absolutely, right? You're getting very nicely the first point, which is Job is not acting like himself, which is supposed to be nice, good, believer, submissive, right? Now he is all over the place, right? So make sure you've written down these three things, right? From submissive, he becomes rebellious. From robotic, he becomes emotional. From, from a, a clear, he becomes confused. And so we are here in a state, he has now arrived in a state where he is confused, all over the place emotionally, rebellious, losing everything that has restrained him. And now let's see what God thinks about this transformation, right? I know I did an aside till the end of the book, but if those of you read further, how does God react? What does he say about Job? How does he compare the friends with Job? What is God's perspective on the friends? And what is God's perspective on Job when you read the very end, the epilogue? Does anybody know? Has anybody gone that far? Whom does God prefer, in other words? Whom does God prefer? The friends or Job? Okay, Ibatulin, go ahead. Uh, God prefers Job and um, he rebukes the friends. And he says, um, you guys should ask uh, Job now that, should, that Job prays for you because you guys were wrong. But Job was right. And yeah, that's what he said. That's a strange, you know, unexpected development. We would expect God to be, you know, telling the friends, thank you for defending me, right? Thank you for standing strong for me, right? And to turn to Job and be like, you, you rebel, right? Get out of my face. How dare you speak up, right, in my presence? And yet, you have the opposite. God is like, oh, these guys, the friends, they don't understand anything. And Job, my servant, he's the one that I love, right? And so this is very strange. Why is it, let's go now and ask ourselves, why is it that God prefers Job? What does Job have in his emotionality, in his confusion, in his rebellion that God appreciates, right? Let's start with the first one. Let's look at confusion. What does God love about our confusion sometimes, right? We are confused. We don't know where to go. We, are, we don't know what's happening. We don't know the next step to take. We're lost. What is, what is deeply attractive about that for God? What do you think? Uh, Al-Hadai, I think you had your hand up. Did you? <laughs> um, well, curiosity, I'm guessing. Okay, very good, right? So let's go one by one, right? The confusion. The confusion is beautiful. Why? Because it entails possibility of growth, right? If you're confused, it means that the old doesn't work. You have to find something new. I want to stop on that briefly because I want to elaborate on this. Anytime you are confused, right? Anytime you are either spiritually or emotionally confused and you don't know what's happening, what is the next step, why this is happening to you, you should rejoice. Why? Because the confusion is a sign that you're moving from an old paradigm into a new paradigm. You're moving from a narrow view to a broader view. Confusion is showing that you are evolving as a human being from, uh, uh, from one way of thinking to a deeper way of thinking. Are you following what I'm saying? Put your hand in the screen if you are, right? So there is here, uh, what, what the text is telling us is that, is that in God's eyes, there is beauty in our confusion. Why? Because this is us broadening this is the process of us expanding and as we expand we don't know where we are <laughs> 
but we are actually indeed expanding. Very good. Uh, see a couple more hands. Um, so Carucci and then Pinto. <clears throat> I, uh, Professor, I was going to say that I think that God likes our confusion because if we knew his will and we understood his way of thinking, then we wouldn't need to rely on him. We wouldn't need him. We'd be just as powerful. Um, and I don't think it's uh, so that he keeps us submissive. I think that it's a perpetual uh, way of us strengthening and keeping our connection to God. Okay, very good. Right, confusion means we are losing control. It means at the same time that we're ready for uh, the journey of faith, right? There is no faith without confusion. If you know where to go, you don't need faith, <laughs> right? You know where to go, right? Confusion, in a way, is the prerequisite of faith. When you are confused, this is when you can trust, right? This is when you can surrender. As long as you're not confused, you're God. <laughs> you're in control right so yes absolutely it, it, as, as islam is saying it's a blessing in disguise pinto go ahead i was gonna say that um uh one of the main reasons why god likes our confusion is because the the faith that we keep in him that was what i was told as a kid whenever i had questions they would always say like you know just keep your faith and although it's a very weird response at the same time it makes sense you know as long as we have faith that this is going to be our salvation that this is going to be what you know keeps us on the good path in life then we don't really have to question because you know as long as we know that things will be good we don't have to worry about it right exactly but without the question there would not be the opening up into faith right a, a believer who has no questions will never experience faith right because they're already fine <laughs> right so even though faith eventually um, appeases our questions the faith can only begin when we've started to explore our questions right Okay, good, good, good. You guys are doing great. Let's go to the second one. Why does God love our emotionality? <laughs> what is beautiful when we are out of control emotionally, whether it's in anger or depression or anxiety, what is beautiful about our emotions? What do you think? Okay, I see three hands. Let's start with Gianna Copulos and then Carucci and then Hama. Hama, Hama mio. <laughs> Okay, go ahead, Gianna Copulos. So, you know, like God gave us free will and when we express our free will, even if it's like our frustration, it pleases him because it shows that like we're not being stagnant. You know, we want to increase in, in our faith and we want to go further on our journey of uh, salvation. And it shows like even if we're mad, like God, why did you do this? Like we actively want to know why something happened instead of just sitting back and letting everything happen to us. Like I wrote in um, uh, or my response, you know, one of our, my criticisms of Job was when everything first started happening to him, he just kind of said, oh, let it, let it be God's will. You know, like God can take and God can give, you know, God, God gave us so much good. He can give us some bad fortune. Right. And I said, I was like, yeah, that's a good way of thinking, but that's only also, it's only a good way of thinking. If you're also wondering, why something bad happened you know like is god giving me a test it's not it's not just saying oh god did bad to me okay that's fine you know is god giving me a test is um is god giving me too much of my plate you know you kind of have to question why these things are happening and if you don't like you're just going to stay stagnant on your spiritual journey okay i love it right our emotions is what um this is what makes us alive and not just little robots, right? Our emotions in a way is us, make sure you write this down, right? Our emotions is us being real with God, right? If you come, the Job at the beginning, you, you mentioned that very nicely, Jenna Kopoulos, the Job who says, you know, I'll take the good and the bad from God. This is the nice believer, Christian, Jewish, whatever, Job, right? Good Muslim Job, good Christian Job, good Jew Job, right? He's saying, okay, it's all good, God is... But when he, when the, when the last thing occurs and he explodes, right? This is Job not putting on a Christian smile anymore, right? This is Job who is losing it completely. He's not even able to play his role of the good Christian, the nice Jew, the good Muslim, right? He's all of it. But at that moment, he's also profoundly real. And this is what God loves. Yeah, he's rude, he's all over the place, he's out of control, but he's real right? He's authentic. He's speaking from the heart. And God is like, yes, that's my man right there. Yeah, he's a little rude. Yes, I know. But 
he's speaking from the heart he's being real and that i appreciate right excellent very good let's see well, professor i just want to add one thing so like you know god likes us to see or use us our emotions even if it's just anger because even he did things out of anger you know like when he destroyed uh sodom and gomorrah that wasn't he didn't happily do it he was angry that people were being so unrighteous and terrible and sinful and like the worst and so he destroyed him. it wasn't out of happiness he did it out of anger you know so it's just like it also shows that we're being more like him in a way excellent right the god of the hebrew bible is very emotional <laughs> right yeah he goes through all the spectrums of emotions right uh he's so so we have right so you're right there is a, in a way emotions are at least in the hebrew context are not things we should be pushing down or repressing it's we should we should actually feel free to feel them right excellent all right let's see who else uh ha haramio and then uh adu sorry adu <laughs> ha hey, um, <laughs> yeah i i was gonna add on to what he said i agree with a lot of what he said um it makes us human it makes us real like you said and uh, i feel like when we are vulnerable like he was our true colors start to come out make sense so it shows like who we yeah. are for real. i you um, I, I will add i mean i'm gonna develop what you said job is being vulnerable this is something we often don't know how to do with god right we try to be all good Christians, right? We sit there, we have these long prayers, nicely embroidered, right? And we try to be all good, you know, stable. God is like, no, be vulnerable, be you. <laughs> if you come all messed up, right? Bad hair, they come, right? Yes. Don't come all together. Let me give in a, a, a story to illustrate what you just said, uh, Haramio, very, uh, which illustrates very nice what, what, uh, what you said. There's a strange rule in the Hebrew Bible that says that when you build an altar, you're not allowed to polish the stones and arrange, cut them and polish them. You have to take the stone in, on the ground and put it as it is. You're not allowed to polish it. It's a strange rule, right? The altar should never be made of polished stone, it says. Can anyone interpret what is the meaning of this? It's, it has something to do with what Haramio just said. Why can we not polish the stones as we build an altar? Oh, an altar is a, a little a mountain of stones on which you do a sacrifice. It's not a statue. <laughs> there are no statues in the Hebrew Bible, God forbid. <laughs> oh yeah, first commandment, sorry. <laughs> there, so it's a little mountain of rocks that you build and on top of it, you, you make a sacrifice. Sing, go ahead, explain to us what you just said. You're on track. Um, what I was gonna say is that this faith's not authentic, so what you're talking about like God wants us to be vulnerable and when we're vulnerable I think we show our true emotions and we express each feeling how it is in the moment so when we polish things I think we're trying to set up a good front or like put up an image that we're truly not and we're not really following our spirituality like that I think life is about like all these things are going to happen to us, all these obstacles. So we're not going to always have a good face on. And yeah, basically. No. Absolutely, right? But when you come to God, you don't bring polished stones. You bring raw, uncut, you unfiltered, right? That's the idea, right? God doesn't, he prefers we come real, authentic, vulnerable, than we come all nice, smelling good, Christian smile, you know? <laughs> it's like, doesn't need that, right? So that's the second thing we learn, right? From this outburst of emotion. Now, here's the tricky one. Why does God love Job's rebelliousness, his insolence, his audacity? Why does God love that? What do you think? Uh, I do. Sorry, I do. It's been a while. I do. Go ahead. No, it's fine. <laughs> um, I was going to say God probably loves him more for the sake that by being rebellious and, you know, speaking his mind, he's actually telling the truth as to what he feels about God, um, which I'm sure as like an all knowing almighty power, you don't really get that a lot, like honesty. Uh, so I feel like god would would like that more that way he doesn't have to feel like okay like i'm i'm getting all this validation and and uh, prayer from a bunch of my followers but how many of them are actually following me for the right reasons like are they just there you know because i'm their god or is it more so like are they going to actually build a connection with me and are they going to be able to tell the truth 
and come to me and you know raw unfiltered just be authentic you got it right in fact one of the main differences between job and his friends is that his friends talk about god but job talks to god make sure you get this difference i'm putting in the, the chat right the friends speak about god but job speaks to god this is the main difference so even though he's being insolent and he has the audacity to say some of the things he says at least he's speaking to god and this is kind of you know it's a nice change for god right as you're saying so nicely i do he so everybody's all there all submissive making prayers you know and there's no one really talking right Finally, someone has the audacity, the backbone to talk back, right? Ah, refreshing, right? So in a way, God finds it refreshing when we're angry and frustrated and, you know, going like this to the heavens. It's like, ah, interesting. Somebody's talking to me down here, right? So yes, there's something beautiful, even if we are insolent and you know inappropriate at least we are speaking to god and this is one of the beautiful moments of job is that he's the only one who pierces right the friends are still all in their bubble speaking about god job actually pierces through and ends up speaking directly to god his anger pushes him to that level right we will be talking about god until something happens that undoes us to the point that we are now speaking to god right the, the the trauma that we go through is the only thing that can bring us to that level right as long as you're a good happy christian or happy jew or happy muslim you're not going to need to speak to god <laughs> you're going to speak about god god is good all the time that is good you know the moment you go through this darkness is the moment you will have no choice but to directly address the creator, right? And this is what Job is able to do, right? Very nicely. Okay, let's see, a few more of you. Um, okay, Ahmad, al Haddai, Karushi, and Mulaiki, in that order. <laughs> Go ahead. I was gonna say that when we're so fixated on our own ideology and our or what we think what God is or what God wants, we kind of start worshiping our own intellect and our own ideas of God rather than God himself. So like you said, Job is trying to break, trying to break that and go directly to the source. Yeah, excellent, right? His friends are still caught up in representations of God. Job has destroyed all representations. In a way, he has destroyed all intellectual idols, and he is now standing in the very presence of the Creator, right? He has broken through all of those representations or conceptualizations of God, and he's now directly saying, Who are you? I want to know now, <laughs> right? Very good. Nice, nice. Let's see. After Ahmad, there was, I forget the order, but I'm going to put Al Hadai. Go ahead. Okay, so I think um, since he did all that, it got this a strong relationship with God. Now it's based on trust and communication. Back then it was just like, give me more money or something like that. <laughs> you got it, right? Now we have trust, vulnerability, we have intimacy, right? There is no intimacy without vulnerability, without expressing without being real right before there was no intimacy between job and god he was just god was some distant thing in the over there and job was doing right now they actually have a relationship right the the, the pain that job went through actually broke him to the point that he was capable of connecting directly to the creator and very often this is the role of pain in our lives right let me stop just a couple seconds on that right when we suffer it is it is an opportunity for us to come out and directly connect in a way that we couldn't as long as everything was going fine right when everything's going fine what do we need to talk to the creator we, do, we talk to our friends <laughs> right the suffering often brings us to the brink it brings us to the limit of ourselves and something ruptures but that rupture is actually what could potentially make possible a direct connection right there's an opportunity in every painful moment to break out of yourselves and do what job did directly establish a connection right with the creator so that's that's very profound right absolutely um al-hadai karuchi <clears throat> hi professor uh 
I was just going to say one thing, but now um, to your last point, you know, I, I have heard many times in my own spiritual journey, you know, uh, from those that are, are further along than I am, you know, it's just as important to pray and talk to God on days when everything is going well in the same way you would on the days when, you know, it's raining and the roof is leaking, you know, because uh, it, you run the risk of taking things for granted if you don't. Um, but what I wanted to share with you in the class is one of the criticisms that I, that I had was my, um, my take on his friends. I, I, what I had said in my writing is that, you know, it seems to me that his friends don't, you know, for as much as they say that they're people of faith, they don't apply any compassion or love or any, you know, emotion of, of friendship towards Job. Like not once did they say, we're going to pray for you so that God ends your suffering. Uh, I, I'm here for you. What do you need? You know, how can I help you? It's all more of the same. It's, you know, he's a fool for what he's thinking. Uh, he's actually a liar because he must have done something wrong, even though he says he doesn't. Like, he, there's no way that he didn't, you know, you come clean. Like, you know, if God really wanted to cross-examine your life, I'm sure he'll find something. <laughs> so it's, um, I don't know, it just seems very hypocritical and very ironic. And you know, the, the, the thought to me there is they seem to know their faith, but they don't know how to apply it. Yeah. And I think that God loves Job in that moment because Job, even at the end of the summation, he says, if you tell me what this is all about, I will bow down before you like a prince. You know, I, he doesn't lose his faith in any of this. He just wants to understand it. How does this apply to what's going on right now? Make me closer to you to understand. And I think that's why God loves Job in that moment, because he's asking him, how does this fit in with you and me and what, we're go what I'm going through? Yeah. Make me understand and I'll be okay with it. Excellent, right? What saves Job throughout all of the craziness that he utters, right, is that he never once loses the connection with the creator. He's angry at the creator, he's insolent, he has enormous audacity, but he is still connecting, right? This is what saves him. There's an invitation here, right? Whatever suffering we go to, right, we go through, keep the connection alive, you know, just be angry, be whatever you want to be, but keep the connection alive. This is what will get you to the other side. At least this is what Job is showing us, right? As long as you keep the connection, it can be a very angry, horrible, uh, you know, frustrated, anxious, depressed connection, right? Doesn't matter how you show up, right? Clearly, as if you are able to maintain that connection, even if it is to just go uh, look up in the sky and be like, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. <laughs> even if, you, if that's what you're saying, right? If you keep that connection, you will end up in a very interesting place at the end of the ordeal, right? There's something beautiful here that we're learning from, from Job. Now, there was one more. Uh, Al Mulaiki, go ahead. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, like, how. Uh, Dad wanted, like, he wanted to prove his innocence, like, so badly, and he said that he would go and speak nothing, no, he, he would go and speak the truth, like, straight to his face, and, like, he was very confident in himself. Yeah, there's absolute beauty in the, the audacity of Job, right? An invitation for us to be the same. Let's not be afraid to do that. That's the idea of the story, right? Good, good. Jasper, I think I skipped a few people, but I'll get back to you. Jasper, uh, go ahead. Um, I kind of agree and disagree with what was said. Um, last person, person before that, that um, I do think he maintained the connection, Joe himself. But I do think that his friends somewhat, you know, sympathized the way that they felt like they should. Um, mm -hmm. They all did pray together um, for, I think, like a seven days straight, just straight silence. Like they didn't even see anything, say anything. They just came and dropped and showed their devoutness right there and i guess you know to maybe job eventually that wasn't enough but at the beginning i feel like that's somewhat of uh you know we're here for you yeah that's true that is a beautiful gesture which they do the first seven days and then they open their mouths yeah. <laughs> which ruins everything right but absolutely that particular some this is also you know something we can learn right when someone is grieving perhaps it's better to just be there and shut up <laughs> don't try to interpret and right the friends are actually showing us you know at least initially how we could deal with someone suffering right 
Uh, let's see, Jenna Kopoulos. Go ahead. I had a I had seen a couple of comments in the in the chat, and um, also Karuchi. He talked about how um, we have to be able to be thankful even when the especially when the times are good, right? So I remember this story. My dad telling me he's a priest, and he's telling me about how um, one saint he had a, a dream. In that dream, he actually went up to heaven. He saw all our prayers going to specific saints and to to God and to the Mother of Christ, you know, Panaya, and so. He saw thousands and thousands of angels carrying our prayers to God, right? Because because God usually gets the most prayers, and then next to uh, the the Panaya, the Mother of God, you know, she got the most prayers, and then it goes down on the on the line who gets the most prayers, all the way down to the least amount of prayers, right? And the least prayers were actually us being thankful. <laughs> there was one, there was one lone angel at the table, and he had a, only a couple envelopes of prayers. <laughs> about how we are about how we are thankful. So a lot of times we pray that uh, we are we are saved, you know, and we pray that we have salvation and that good things happen to us. But then lots of times we don't actually pray saying that we're thankful for what we got and, re and reward for our prayers, you know. And so I just thought that was interesting because yeah, lots of good things happen to us in life, and we have to be really thankful when they do happen. Like, out of all of God's miracles, right, out of, out of all of Jesus Christ's miracles, I don't know, because I know we have some Muslim people and some people from other faiths, but I'm Orthodox Christian. And in the Bible, it said um, in Christ, all of Christ's miracles, only one person ever came back to actually thank him, right? And that was the blind man. The blind man was the only one that truly came back and thanked him for returning his sight not even knowing what Christ really looked like, but he knew that it was Christ and he wanted to be thanked. He wanted to thank him. You know, even when he healed the paralytic, the paralytic never came back from the rooftop. You know, he never came back down to say thank you. He kind of slept. So that, that like really reminded me of that story about how we just need to be more thankful and not just pray for what we need, but pray just to be grateful. And it's interesting you bring that up because Job, even in the prologue when everything is going well, there is no prayer of thankfulness. There is still the prayer of fear. Please let my children not right, sin. So we, he, right, this is another reason why Job is not yet very elevated in the prologue, right? If he becomes a prophet, like the Muslim tradition says, it's not yet the case in the prologue, right? He's not there yet. Okay. Let me conclude briefly, and then we can stay behind and, and go through a few more of your questions, right? So the bottom line, right, what we're seeing here is that Job becomes human, right? He was kind of the perfect believer, and now he has become human. And what's interesting is that it is as he falls into his humanity, he becomes confused and rebellious and angry and emotional. This is when he reaches the highest spiritual level. This is very powerful, right? Until you fall into your own humanity, until you embrace your humanity, until you become human, right? And not trying to put on a show, until you become you, <laughs> real, only then will you begin to access a higher level of spirituality, right? That's what we're learning. As Job is becoming more human, he's becoming more spiritual. This is the opposite of what many religions teach, right? Many religions say, no, you have to leave behind your humanity. You have to become perfect and then God will accept you. Here we have the opposite. The more human we are, the more vulnerable, the more fragile, the more broken, the more angry, the more frustrated, the closer we can get to the realm of the creator, right? And so this is an invitation, right? For us to be human, to be real. Let's be authentic, right? Let's be fully real because this is the type of encounter that God loves, right? Coming as we are, all messed up, as long as we're coming is good, right? That would be one of the lessons, right? You're full of doubts and anger and frustration. Perfect. <laughs> you're ready, right? You're depressed. You're lonely. You don't know what to do next. That's it. You're ready. You're at this love. You're on the verge, right? Of having this amazing direct connection, right? So anytime we fall into these states that most religions despise, you're depressed, you're angry, you're frustrated, you're anxious, and everyone is telling you, have faith, have faith. The text is, is not saying have faith. The text is saying, 
be angry, be frustrated, be anxious, but come, <laughs> show up, talk, say it, express it, right? And then we'll see what happens, right, from that. Now, next time, we're going to see God's answer. And what I want you to do, the little homework you do in addition to the reading assignment, little homework in your head, I want you to think whether you like that answer or whether you don't like that answer, right? I'm going to ask you how many of you liked the answer and how many of you didn't like the answer. We're going to look at that. And then we're going to look at the epilogue, which remember is ironic. This is not to be taken literally. There is some irony there too, right? So we need to be aware of that. Okay. By the way, great reading assignments, right? Um, I really enjoyed it. Now, we can continue the, the questions. If you need to leave, you can leave. If you want to stay, you can stay. Let me continue getting the last few questions. Um, Islam and then uh, Jenna Kopoulos. And then I saw Jasper. Jasper. I think some people were before me. Oh, wait. They took their hands down? Jasper? Gone. <laughs> Jasper. <laughs> For life. Jenna Kopoulos. He forgot to take his hand down from the last. Oh, okay. Question. All right, yes, so we can continue a little bit the, the discussion. Um, uh, Islam, go ahead. Because uh, Really quickly, I just wanted to also add how, because Gianna, I can't, uh, I'm trying to pronounce your name, bro. Gianna Coppolis. Mm -hmm. Gianna Coppolis. Correct? Yeah, Gianna Coppolis. Gianna Coppolis. All right, copy. Um, yeah, so basically, I want to add uh, how what you were saying, how we should be grateful, and also to what Karuchi was saying, that in our blessings, we should be grateful because. Uh, I don't know, it's also good to be grateful in our blessings and our trials, try to keep it balanced. But I also read something, it may be a Sufi saying or some type of, I don't know the source, I can't give it to you the source, but I do remember it says that the believer when he's grateful, no, when he does good things for like, you know, acquiring worldly wealth or money, or he's doing uh, good deeds to acquire good, like he's doing good things to acquire good deeds on his scale of good deeds or a scale of bad deeds. Well, I the person who like does that is more of a merchant and the person who is actually worshiping the creator in the many ways we all worship the creator in different shapes and forms and different uh, ways of worship that the ones who actually worship the creator because they're grateful but not for, is actually most beloved to god compared to people who do it just for good deeds and they you know they're trying to rack up good deeds as like, as like a type of currency for the afterlife so I just want to say that, yeah, being grateful goes a long way. And from my perspective, being grateful, the creator has said, if you're grateful, then you will be given more. So, Okay, but be careful, guys, who are staying a long time on gratefulness. There is no gratefulness here. Not in the book. Not in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Let's not try and gloss this over and be like, oh, we should be grateful. This is not what Job is teaching us, right? He's not saying be grateful at all times. He's saying be real. If you don't feel grateful, don't don't say anything right so be careful not to turn job into a saint right? yeah. i feel like you, you can, that. Yeah. we can be grateful and like think like we're like on the right path but like how yeah. do we really act when we're tested exactly exactly yeah. and what we're learning is that it's okay not to feel grateful you know what i mean it's okay at times to not feel grateful and to not say anything grateful and to on the contrary complain <laughs> that's what we're learning here right so be careful i i totally get it the gratefulness but be careful because this is not what the text is teaching right now right we will see this gratefulness by the way um islam when we study the sufi poet uh, rumi he will be mentioning this, this notion, right? But here in the text, I don't want to move too far away from the text. We have no gratefulness. Yeah, <laughs> right? bad. No worries, no worries. Jana Kopoulos, you have one last comment? Let yeah, so... Let about gratefulness. <laughs> no, 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 that's not. So you were saying how, um, like, a lot of religions preach not to show your emotions and stuff like that. But, um, like, in my religion, we don't, we don't preach that because... You know, we, we see in front in the Bible, you know, Christ showed his emotions multiple times. You know, he showed his anger at the with the merchants uh, in the temple, right? He showed how sad he was when his friend um, Lazarus died and when he went to go resurrect him, you know. He showed emotions multiple times. Even God shows emotions when, uh, like when he flooded the world, when uh, he des destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, right? You know, he they both showed emotions during these times. And it's good to show emotion because it shows that we're way more real. Like yeah. you were saying before, we're more real with God, you know, when we're sad that, uh, let's say like our spouse died, you know, it's like, God, why do you take it from her? You know how sad it would make me be, you know, 
stuff like that. It makes us show that we're more real with him. Good. And, and yeah, like, like Islam, Islam is saying, God gave us emotions for a reason, not so that we could lock, lock them away, right? Like, just like he gave us free will, he wants us to use these emotions because these emotions can um, allow us to reach greater heights. Excellent, right? And I love the way you describe the Christ, right? Jesus was very emotional. <laughs> and we all, when I watch a movie, right, with, with, about Jesus, it's always this kind of very placid Buddha kind of, you know, very peaceful, always serene face, no emotion. It, it just drives me crazy because the actual Jesus in the Gospels was very emotional, right? Very passionate. And we don't see this in the cinematography, right, when we have a movie about it. So excellent, very good point. Yeah, like one of the, one of our icons of Christ is um it was made by two different people, right? Um half his face was made by one and the other half was made by the other. And it shows like his two natures. One that he's very passionate and uh loving, and the other one showing that he's um his sternness, you know, and his willingness to like kind of put you down, you know. And and that doesn't show that Christ has no emotion. It shows that Christ is emotion, right? Yeah. Christ is love, Christ is sternness, Christ is anger, Christ is he's many things, right? Excellent. And like that's what we have to learn from him. Very good. Good example. Um, excellent. Anybody else before we conclude? Okay, good. Um, let's see. I do. Um, good. I th if any of you, all right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude. If any of you still have questions, I do, you can stay. Uh, whoever else, you can um, you can go. But if you still want to talk personally, we can talk. I'm always available, as you know, after class for any further questions or crisis you're going through, spiritual crisis. I'm always there for that. So you can always come after class. I'm always free for anything you're dealing with, whether it's a question of on class or a question about your life. <laughs> All right. So you guys can go. Um, I think there's. I'm looking in the chat. Um, Ah, uh, yes, we can talk. I'll, I'll do about it. I do, sorry, I'll do about it. Um, as soon as I get uh, the homework, colon, what do you mean? What do you want to know? I'm like, what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to read the other half of the book? Yes. <laughs> it's always the same thing. You read the other half, you do the same reading assignment. The same, okay. Always the same. Yes, colon. <laughs> Good. Anybody else? I'm like, you have a question? No, okay. Um, I don't see your name anymore. Uh, the one with the hand up. Ah, Al Haddai, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. So uh, I don't remember exactly, but he said that um, there are a lot of crimes and God sees these crimes, but he does nothing. So he acts like he didn't see anything. Right? So since he had all these thoughts, he thinks that God is not perfect and like, he's not doing the stuff that he promised that he's going to do. Why believe in him from the first place? Ah, you have to wait. We don't know yet what God is thinking, right? We're not there yet because the prologue we know is faith, <laughs> right? So we're going to wait next time when we get to the God's response, actual response when he's talking, then we're going to have a different, we're going to see, right? Who God truly is. So then you can see, you'll have a clear vision, right? Of the type of, of the vision of God that the author is trying to give us, right? So maybe then you will, your question will be answered, right? So is, is that what you were, you were saying something about, remind me exactly what you were saying so I can remember it when I talk about it um, next time? Um, he said that God sees crimes, but he does nothing about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He acts like he didn't see anything. Yeah, yeah. Though. yeah, this is the question we all have, right? How can God, who has the power to change things, not do anything, right? This is the question, right? So when we have the response, the whole class, by the way, is on this question, right? Everybody that we're going to study is going to ans answer this question differently. So wait until we get next time when we'll see God's answer and tell me at the end of class, if you were at the beginning, maybe you were not satisfied, but tell me at the end of class, how you feel about that answer. If it answered that question right now. All right. We have to wait. <laughs> okay. I'll have uh, Isaiah, who is Isaiah? What's your last name, Isaiah? No answer. Wait, wait, which Isaiah? Because there's like three in the class. There's one here uh, that says Isaiah A. Okay, yeah, because I'm Isaiah too, so I was Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> sorry, yeah, okay. 
Is that is not answering. Go ahead, Abdul. Ask your question. You you were talking about psychedelics. Yeah. Okay. So I was wondering because like a lot of the stuff that you talk about and mention in class, like go hand in hand with, I guess, psychedelic talk because like that's something that I particularly <laughs> study as well. Um. So like whenever you say like certain things, I'll like reflect back to like psychedelic talk, and I'm like, oh my god, like that something that I've either personally experienced or have witnessed and heard other people like talk about and through their experiences and i'm just like hmm, like does the professor have like any kind of like knowledge in that realm like what is this psychedelic talk tell me what am i saying that sounds like psychedelic uh, talk. okay so like <laughs> the, when, when you mentioned today about paradigm shifts right yeah granted the word par paradigm can be used in like a general sense but like in psychedelic talk and like theories i guess um paradigm shifts are like a really big thing um so that that's why i was like a little like i guess curious to see whether or not you knew anything about it but yeah so yeah so no <laughs> i don't know anything about psychedelics okay so, right, there is when they describe the experiences this notion of expansion of your mind right mm -hmm. and also this notion of entering a new paradigm um there are ways to do this i mean life can do this to you too right, right. So, of course, you can chemically induce it or you can go through some trauma, which will do this, have this effect. If you allow right. it, right, you have to suffer mm. in the right way. So, yeah, so I tend to think with regards to psychedelics that you can achieve these the same effects um, also, mm. you know, through experientially, right? Right. Um, so in general, but... Uh, <laughs> That's interesting. I never, I'm going to remember that, that I sound, uh, that I, that what I'm saying sounds like psychedelic talk. <laughs> no, it does a lot. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I guess, you know, philosophy in a way, I think does that to your mind, right? Because it does, yeah. The psychedelics are there to kind of open your mind and mm -hmm. start to think outside of the box. If you study philosophy long enough, you're so used to hearing other perspectives and yeah. also arguing for them, even if you don't <laughs> agree, that your mm -hmm. mind develops in the same way as if you were taking LSD or whatever. Right. <laughs> so maybe it's the philosopher's mind you're tapping into. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was just like, yeah. wow, they, they're so similar. Like, because <laughs> like. <laughs> I, I I can't I can't say without personally getting myself in trouble, but like, let's say a friend has experience in that, um, but like through those experiences, like, I've come to know, I guess my own like philosophical view on life, I guess, but it like coincides with everything that you teach, so that's why I was like curious about it. I used to tell my students, you know, um, don't do drugs, do philosophy, you, don't have to do that, <laughs> yeah. you know, so there are ways. And in fact, if you go even deeper in Eastern philosophy, right, mm -hmm. they are able to induce some Buddhism. of these states, mm -hmm. right, through meditation, yeah. through certain practices. So, uh, and in fact, if you go into, if you study a little bit, the, the, uh, there's a, a guru right now who is very famous. Um, I mean, he's not particularly Hindu, but he's very famous right now called Sadhguru. I don't know if you've heard of him. I haven't, no. Look him up. He's very big right now in India. He's kind of the, you know, bringing Hinduism in a very palatable way to Western audience. And he says something okay. like this. He says, you know, I can reach those states through meditation naturally, right? I don't need to bust mm -hmm. cells in my brain to do it. I can okay. actually, through enough practice, reach. So he tends to say it is good to want to expand your mind, but there are different ways of doing right. that. Right. Mm -hmm. So no, yeah. you can look into him, he, he has an interesting approach. But yeah, I would say philosophy will have the same effect, <laughs> as you can <laughs> <Okay>. see clearly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure, yeah. That's so funny. I'm, I'm going to tell my friends you said that, and we're going to have a good laugh. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you so much. No worries, Adu. Anything else, anybody here? Okay, great. Okay. I'll, I'll, I can go. I'll stay behind. I'll stay behind. It's fine. You what, Ahadai? Mm -hmm. I'll stay behind. I said it's fine. They can go. Okay, great. Okay. All right. Perfect. Um, okay. So, go ahead. Well, from our discussion, our group discussion, I still have my question that I didn't really understand. So, why would God, why would God listen to an accuser, something that he made? Why would he test Job, even though like he's God, he's so knowledgeable, he knows everything, he's so aware. So, why test his servant, even though like he knows, he does not need to test them if he already knows. Be careful, that's the prologue, right? This is a kind of imaginary scenario, right? That the author is coming up with. 
kind of to set up this story, right? Remember, this is a work of fiction. It's not, you know, literal, right? The intention of the text is not to be literal. There are passages in the Bible that are to be taken literally, not this one. <laughs> so here he's kind of setting it up in a no, way. Look, like, same way with Adam and Eve. Why set the tree? Like he already, he already <laughs> knows the answer. He made Adam and Eve. You know, if you want to know this question, I am teaching a class on the tree. Exactly that question uh, on, on um, Tuesdays and Thursdays. You should show up. I'm going to give you the exact times. Uh, but to make, a, to make it short, the tree, in my view, the important function of the tree is to place a limitation. If we have no limitation, right, as human beings, if we can do whatever we want, we are missing something important, which is ethics, right? In other words, if you can do anything you like, if there's no limitation placed on you, you're going to just take. <laughs> right and if you're never taught that there are things you can't take you're going to become a completely immoral person right so the tree in a way and again i don't know if this is a literal right or if it is just a symbolic reenactment that god is saying here there is a limit you need to have limits right you can't just eat every fruit there are things that aren't fruits <laughs> right you know what i mean so this is i think the purpose of the tree in the garden is to teach the human being that there are things they cannot touch right there are things they cannot possess there are things they cannot take and well, the same, beginning of well, he, he didn't teach them he didn't tell adam and eve anything he just told them not to touch the tree yeah, yeah. but and that's not like yeah. literally teaching it's just no, but remember famous. this is not a literal story right this is a philosophical story where we're learning through the story that god at least when we interpret it god might be teaching them limitation do you see what i'm saying does that make sense yeah yeah so in that sense right so um how does this connect to job what was the thing you said before oh yeah the prologue right so be careful right because he's simply this is he's kind of because that's what i thought the author is doing yeah, just um, like he's, it's a fiction, right, that will lead him. He's trying to make the story interesting. But we will see that the God of the prologue is nothing like the God that will emerge, right, in the dialogue. So he wants to move away from that traditional vision. A lot of us see God like this. Oh, God is, you know, allowing suffering so I can be tested so we can see if I'm a good That's what they say. They be like, like, they tell us if you pray, if you're like, if you read or whatever, you do all the religious stuff, you're going to get good things. Yep. You'll get money, you'll get rich, and you get closer to God and you'll go to heaven. So what God. Job did was he was on the right track. Yes. He's not doing anything wrong. Perfect. So in the prologue, it's what they say. Okay, I, I do know. And it, it's so obvious because he has slaves, which is... Exactly. And he's, he's like, he's just not... All his, the stuff that he's saying at the end, it just means that he, from the start, he had all these questions, but he couldn't say them. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So we're moving away from this traditional view that if you're good, you'll be rich and God is, you know, testing you. It's, it's not happening. This is not what is what the author wants us to know. So we're moving away from that vision. Make sense, uh, al -Hadde? Yeah, you can call me Mona. <laughs> I like al -Hadde. It sounds nice. <laughs> yeah, I do like my, my last name too, but it's easier because people can't, not everyone can pronounce al -Hadde. al -Hadde, what does it mean al -Hadde? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> get up, get up. I'm interested. Yeah, so we'll see. Well, we're going at to enter the God's response, and it's a very multi layered response, easily misunderstood. We're going to see next time. It's going to be very exciting. <laughs> Anything right. else from either of you? <laughs> no, I'm okay. You're good. No, at... just what was the name of that class that you were teaching about the tree? Oh, yeah. Plato in the Bible. Yeah, you guys should come. Um, if you email me, I'll send you a syllabus and a Zoom. Okay. And you can join anytime you want to. This is PHIL uh, 250. And I teach it on this in the same classroom, actually. You don't need the link. You just show up in the same classroom anytime you want. You're always welcome. Tuesday, Thursday, 310 to 425. So anytime you want to come. So we're actually going to do the tree. So to, uh, this week, uh, I think next Tuesday. But you want to come because we're going to do uh, Adam and Eve for the next three, two weeks, right? So tomorrow I will introduce the book of Genesis. Uh, Thursday I will talk about Genesis 1 and 2. This is the creation of the man and the woman. And then next Tuesday we'll talk about the tree and the curse, right? And everything. So you can come anytime. We're doing a lot. We're doing Genesis. We're doing Ecclesiastes. We're do I'll send you the syllabus. We're doing um, actually the Gospel of John. 
it's a whole text, uh, it's on the Hebrew Bible, the book of Ruth, Esther, Song of Songs. This is the program, right? So if you want, if you email me, I'll send you the syllabus. And anytime you want to pop in, you can pop in. Same classroom. <laughs> Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Care. Bye. Bye, guys. Have a good one. See you. Yep, see you. Isaiah A, who is mm -hmm. it? Isaiah A. Oh, no, Isaiah, I'm, I'm leaving. Isaiah A, I'm leaving.